Amen. You may be seated. And this is that time where children age birth to eight years old have opportunity to come and hear the same message, just kind of more on a kid level. However, you do need one of these blue bracelets. One's for your child, one's for you. If you don't have a blue bracelet yet, there's a table out there where they can hook you up with everything you need in order to do that. So, and as the kids make their way to uh, the area where they'll have their Bible lesson, please join me uh, in praying for them. And we are, just before we do that, so excited about the number of children that God has blessed the bridge with. And, uh, you know, just we're uh, wanting to be participatory. As I heard you guys sing, uh, you participated in that. And that was huge. We don't come to church to sit and watch. We come to church to actively worship and sing. And uh, thank you for the way in which your singing uh, blessed my heart today. So let's pray for our children. Father, we thank you so much for the children of the bridge. And we ask, Lord, that they may know with confidence that your love endures forever. And that they may know your son, Jesus, in a personal way, even at a young age, just like you spoke to Samuel at age eight, Lord. We pray that you would speak to the children in a way that allows them to know of you and to know your great love for them. Lord, we also pray that you may speak to us through your word and through your spirit as we open your word today. We look forward to what you are going to do today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a real quick review of last week, because Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4 kind of go together, or Acts chapter 4 is a little confusing. So the quick synopsis of last week, Peter and John are walking to the temple to pray, and there is a crippled beggar there, And they ask this crippled beggar to look at them. And the crippled beggar kind of goes, oh, good, maybe I'm going to get something. He's thinking silver and gold or gold. And Peter says, silver or gold, I do not have. But what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. And then Peter does something really cool. He stoops down and he picks this guy up. And as he's getting up, his legs are strengthened, his ankles are beginning to work, and the Bible says he goes from walking to jumping to leaping to praising God on his way into the temple. And uh, it was joyful, it was expressive, it caused a crowd to show up. And as this crowd shows up, Peter, who after he denied he knew Jesus three times, just wanted to stay in a room with a locked door. After the Holy Spirit came down and filled Peter, Peter's basically like the more the merrier because I want everybody I know to hear this good news of great joy that's for all people called the gospel. So Peter seizes the moment and seizes the opportunity and he begins to explain how Jesus was crucified. And by the way, you in the crowd had something to do with Jesus' crucifixion, but that's not the end of the story. But God raised him from the dead and now he's seated on a throne and he is reigning as king of kings and lord of lords but he has poured out his spirit so that you can have peace with god you don't have to be at war with god so there's hope so you need to repent so that times of refreshing may come i don't know about you but times of refreshing that sounds pretty good if you've ever just kind of gone through one of those weeks that like you're sort of in a blender And you're like, man, if there's anything else that could go wrong this week, like it's crazy. Could something else go wrong this week? And then Peter says, if you repent, and repentance is basically, if this side of the 
Not that you all are the side that picks sin and you all are the side that picked God, okay? Uh, it's not that, but if this is sin and this is Jesus, repentance is I am staring at sin, I am living in sin, and I'm gonna repent and I'm gonna turn from sin and I'm gonna look to Jesus. So my back is towards sin and now my eyes are on Jesus. And, and the gospel says that when you do that, there is something that you can bank on that's guaranteed that will happen. Times of refreshing will come. Peace that passes all understanding will come. Joy that is unspeakable and full of glory, the Bible says, will happen when you turn from sin and you turn to Jesus. As Peter's preaching in Acts chapter 3, there are many, many people that are hearing this message. There's a joke out there that if, if you want to actually have a Bible study on prayer, you will actually get more people to come to the Bible study about prayer than if you actually call a prayer meeting where the agenda is, we're going to pray. It seems as though these early Jews and early Christians, they have this, the Bible says that Peter and John went up at the time of prayer. And we're going to find out in a little bit that there's 5,000 plus people there because there were 5,000 men who believed the gospel. That's a pretty big prayer meeting. And they were there just to pray and to meet with God and connect with Him so that times of refreshing may come. The problem is though, the Jews that are going to the temple for the time of prayer don't yet know that Jesus is the rescuer, that He's the Savior, that He is the indispensable piece of the puzzle. So Peter says, hey, I'm Jewish. And we have the Old Testament. And we're God's chosen people. And God promised that he was going to bring a Messiah. And guess what? His name is Jesus of Nazareth. And guess what else also? You crucified him. To which, if I were there, I would probably, if I believe this, say, Oops. What's that mean? But God raised him from the dead. There is hope. We are not hopeless as Christians. Chapter 4. As they were speaking to the people. Okay, this is right as this is all going on. It says, first of all, the priests and then the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came upon them. Okay, now the Greek here is stronger than the English. What actually ends up happening here is Peter and John are just preaching and excited and enthusiastic and there are tons of people listening and the temple guard guy, he's in charge of keeping law and order at the temple. And he has second rank, okay? The only guy that's more important than the temple guard is the high priest. So he's sort of the enforcer bouncer, so to speak, of the temple. And this big time bouncer of the temple comes on with all the priests and all the Sadducees. And the NIV says that they seize Peter and John. This is not one of these things where they actually walk up to Peter and John and say, hi, let me introduce myself. And by the way, what are you talking about? They have gotten a glimpse already of what Peter and John are talking about. So it's almost like they sneak up behind Peter and John and just grab them and pull them off. Why? The Bible answers it in verse 2. They were greatly annoyed because Peter and John were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That's it. They were talking about Jesus. 
And these priests and Sadducees were ticked off. And so we're going to stop this. And they use the force of the world. It's sort of an exertion of power, of brute strength. And say, we're going to scare you into submission. Now, they could have tried to try them. But it was late into the night and it would have been tough to convene a council at this point. So it says they arrest them and put them in custody until the next day. So these Peter and John preaching in the temple and they get arrested and now they're in jail. One commentator says this though and I love it. You can arrest the apostles but you are not able to arrest the gospel. Look at what happens in verse 4. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. You know what these priests and these Sadducees think that they're capable of doing? We will do whatever it takes to suppress the messenger and therefore also the message will be suppressed as well. And that does not happen. Because in the little bit of time that Peter got to preach, the word of God went out with power accompanied by the spirit of God and over 5,000 people say, I believe this. I am going to turn from my sin and turn to my Savior and my Rescuer. That is the hope of the persecuted church throughout the world. And that hope stands firm for them. In 53 countries in the world today, it is against the law to preach in Jesus' name. And these guys, our brothers and sisters in Christ, in these countries where it's against the law, they're being jailed, and they're being beaten, and they're being persecuted, and they're being killed, and they can do all of those things with a smile on their face. Because they know that even if they get beaten and arrested and killed, this message of good news, of great joy for all people, is not dependent upon whether they're free or in jail, alive or dead. It's dependent upon Jesus in heaven, King of kings, Lord of lords, interceding and praying for all of us because he loves us that much and his love endures forever. This message will go out. It will not fail. Any attempt to shoot this message down will ultimately fail. So Peter and John, I do believe this though. I don't believe Peter and John were expecting to spend the night in jail. Now let's think about this for a second. I said God's really moving in your heart. And you sense that he is just calling you to do something really special. And the Bible says that obedience is blessed by God. You know, it's kind of funny sometimes we like to define how we're going to be blessed when we obey. Say, okay, God, I'm going to make a commitment to be faithful to church attendance, and therefore, you're going to fix my financial situation, and you're going to cause this strained relationship to be healed, and that's the way that you're going to bless me as a result of my obedience. Have I ever done that before? Has that worked for you? It hasn't really worked for me. There are blessings with obedience. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, Paul writes, anyone who desires to live a godly life will be persecuted. When you seek to follow Jesus and be obedient to him, he does not promise you roses. He promises you peace through the storm.
but there will be storms. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. That's one of those promises that Christians aren't quick to claim. It is a song, Standing on the Promises. I've not ever heard anyone stand on that one. In this world, I'm going to have trouble. Praise God. It just doesn't have a good ring to it. But the promise doesn't stop with, in this world, you will have trouble. The promise stops with, but take heart, I have overcome this world. So when persecution comes, when Peter and John are sitting in jail, I have this thought in my mind that one thing that perhaps Peter and John are thinking about is, is Peter talking to John, hey John, we're in jail tonight, aren't we? And John smiles and says, yeah, you know what, Peter? This ain't our home. And Peter says, that's right. This isn't our home. The Bible says that for Christians, we are pilgrims here. We are traveling through. Our citizenship is in heaven. And the Bible describes heaven as a, as a place, as an unshakable kingdom. Can we be shaken in this world? Absolutely. There is very little security in this world. There is incredible security and sure foundation of which all believers in Jesus are citizens of. So there is a movement in Christendom that I think doesn't do justice to Christendom. Sometimes it's described as the prosperity gospel. Sometimes it's described as health, wealth, and prosperity, where you give to God and then God is going to do, and then you fill in the blank. You know what God's going to do? God has made one promise to you and I. He is going to work all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. That does not mean all things are good. That means that God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. When persecution hits you, notice I said when, not if, it will happen. And all of you have a story of ways in which it's hit you. It is supposed to cause us to say, okay, God, I trust you, and this is not my home, and I'm traveling through, and I can put my trust in you, that you will protect me from every evil that could totally undo me. So Peter and John are in jail. And then the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gather together in Jerusalem. And then there's a list of people here with Annas, or Annas, something like that, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. They think that there was a board of 71 members, okay? 71 people, plus these other four guys, plus probably a handful of another 20 or 30 people. And they had formed this semicircle around Peter and John, and then they begin the interrogation process. And the interrogation begins with a question, by what power or by what name did you do this? Well, what did they do? Peter and John, moved by the Holy Spirit, caused a dude that had been crippled for 40 years to walk. And now he's on trial. They're on trial for helping a crippled guy walk. Man, they really broke the law, didn't they? They did something good. Verse 8. By the way, Caiaphas and Annas show up in John chapter 18 in another trial. Guess whose trial? Jesus's. Guess who they executed? Jesus. These guys are used to trials, and they're used to using brute strength 
to try to seek to stop something. Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus predicted that stuff like this was going to happen when he still walked the earth. And he said that there are going to be people who are going to seize you and grab you and put you in jail and put you in prison. And they are going to have you stand be beside, be uh, right in front of the rulers. And you do not need to worry about what you are going to say at that moment. The Holy Spirit of God will give you exactly what you need in that moment. Nick said a couple weeks ago, I was just doing the scripture readings, that it's been fun to watch how Peter has come through in the clutch. You know, especially in the baseball playoffs, you know, you get this clutch guy. Okay, I've got some people who I think are really good during the regular season who like choke whenever it's clutch time in playoffs. And I will resist the temptation to mention any names um, at this point. And then there's people who sometimes like they live for October baseball and they come through at, at clutch time. Peter was clutch because of who spoke through him, who is always clutch. The Holy Spirit is always clutch. The Holy Spirit always comes through at the right time, in the right way, with the right words, with the right people. So it really goes about, like, when, when you're struggling with something, it's really about who you trust. When I trust Stephen, I choke. When I trust the Holy Spirit... I come through a clutch because of who is speaking through me at that time. So Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit and says to them, and I think this greeting is interesting, rulers of the people and elders. He is demonstrating respect for people who grabbed him, seized him, pulled him, yanked him off to jail, and he got to spend the night in jail for one night unjustly, and he speaks to these people in a respectful tone. I'm not sure how many of us are capable of doing that. Somebody grabs us and unjustly puts us in jail. There might be a few four-letter words flying once we get face-to-face -face with them. But Peter is filled with God. He's filled with the Holy Spirit and says, I'm going to respect you. I recognize that God himself actually puts you in these positions. So you're the rulers and elders of the people. And then he says, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done. Keep in mind, guys, there were 5,000 people who believed the gospel when Peter preached it. So this is, oh yeah, this, this was a good deed done, and by the way, you guys know that it was a good deed done, and here's the crippled guy who's probably there, and he's walking now. If you're concerned about that, and by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you. Now let's stop here for a second. You know what Peter could have done? Peter could have wiggle waggled his way out. I have a feeling getting seized by the captain of the temple guard produces bruises. He knows that Caiaphas and Annas were two guys who executed Jesus. He could have at that moment said, guys, we're cool, right? Let me just go home now. I'm not sure I'm really willing to pay the price. So can I just leave and I'll behave? He also didn't say, 
my fault, crippled guy got healed, but we're not, we won't talk about like what name we did this in because that name, that causes, it's like mixing oil and water when you've got people who don't know how powerful this name is. It's funny how so many people will talk about God, but not that many will mention Jesus. And he says, I'm not going to defend myself. I am going to boast about Jesus. Notice what he does. This, this is what the Holy Spirit does, okay? When a person is really filled with the Holy Spirit, they brag and boast about Jesus. There's a lot of preaching that takes place, a lot of Bible teaching, a lot of so-called Christianese that actually is not a result of being filled with the Spirit. And the litmus test on whether someone's filled with the Spirit or not is how much are they bragging about Jesus? One who brags about Jesus is legitimately filled with the Spirit. And one who doesn't, they may just be really religious and that's not always good because it was very religious people who killed Jesus. But if you're bragging about Jesus. This is what Peter's doing here. He says, let it be known, and notice who he wants it to be known to. Let it be known to all of you, the elders and the rulers, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man, is standing before you well. Peter didn't have to say all that. What's he want people to know? He wants all people everywhere, all of Israel. Who is Israel? Israel is God's chosen people. The people who God sent Jesus to first. Bible says in John 1, he came to those which were his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. A lot of times we say, oh, well, I'm a child of God. You're a child of God. Everybody's a child of God. That's actually not biblically right. Every single one of us have been created in God's image. And that is an amazing thing. And that's every human being that d distinguishes us between the animals, okay? God breathed life into us. We're special that way. We've been created in God's image. But because we sinned, we became orphaned, okay? We ran away from our father's house and we're orphans without a father. And God sent his one and only son, Jesus, to come and bring the orphans back home again. And it is he who brings the orphans home. You don't all of a sudden wake up someday and say, I really need to get back to my father's house. Jesus comes to find you and brings you back. He won't do it against your will, but he will move in such a way that causes your will to be so aligned with his that when he comes to rescue you out of the hell that you've created for yourself by being away from your father's home, you give him a huge hug. And I think sometimes Jesus gives us piggyback rides on our way back to our father's house again. So what happens? He wants everybody to know everywhere. We are orphaned. And when Jesus comes to get us, there's this beautiful thing called adoption that takes place. Our heavenly father adopts us into his family. And at that point, after placing our trust and faith in Jesus and in Jesus alone, at that point, we become children of God. We are not born that way. We become children of God.
Peter's pumped and he wants people to know that. The way that this happens is interesting because in verse 11, then it goes on to say, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. Much the same way John does it in John chapter 1. He came to those which were his own, but his own refused him. And he's saying, you guys are missing it also. Um, this past Friday night, we, we did a personality thing with Myers-Briggs uh, temperament thing. You get these four letters or whatever. And it's crazy how these four letters will tell you a lot about who you are. And then also, once you find out somebody else's four letters, they'll tell you a lot about what uh, the people are that, that you know. Okay, it's, it's a cool thing. And, okay, that was a rabbit trail? A little bit. And now I'm bringing it back. Um, so, okay, it is my personality, apparently, that uh, I, I get distracted easily and I get real excited. So I'm like, oh, wow, look, there's a bird. And then I get back to the sermon. Um, okay, and this is where it's going. I am always in the middle of about six or seven books. So I am not going to be able to give this illustration justice. I went through those six or seven books last night to try to find where I read this, and I can't find it. But there is this story told that I read this past week in one of the books that I'm in the middle of that uh, about a... Uh, just guy that grabs a violin and he goes to a subway uh, station and he opens up the violin case and he throws a couple dollars in there and he begins playing and he's got a uh, Washington Nationals baseball cap on. I think he's in DC and, uh, and, and he's playing the violin and after a whole day he's got some, it's less than $30. And people were walking by and just not giving him the time of day. What they did not know about this violinist was the night before he sold out one of the most premier or auditorium wherever they play the violins and, and, and all that and made thousands and thousands of dollars where people were willing to spend $100 a ticket to come and listen to him the night before. You see, Jesus came down from heaven to earth the first time with a baseball cap on. And he played this beautiful music, which is no different than perfection. But he played it the Bible says in Isaiah that he was a man of no reputation. He did not come as an elite name. And because we care so stinking much about elite names in today's world and today's society, we missed the visitation of the Son of God the first time. And we weren't even willing to throw a quarter into the violin case for this perfection, perfected music. Well, the one who came once, the Bible says, is coming again. And when he comes a second time, he will sell out the auditorium. And at that moment, that time, every knee will bow and every tongue confess, Philippians 2 tells us, that he is Lord. That he is all he says he is. They rejected the cornerstone, the chief, chief piece of the puzzle because he didn't come the way they wanted him to. And he didn't sell out the auditorium. And he wasn't rich and famous. So Nathaniel, who eventually became one of his disciples, actually said, Nazareth, nothing good can come out of that podunk town. <laughs> the Son of God came out of that podunk town. And here's the beauty of the gospel, the good news of great joy for all people, is that even though we have orphaned ourselves because of sin, Jesus by the Holy Spirit is here now in this place 
knocking on the door of our hearts, saying, I'm here. That music, it's beautiful. It's perfect. And you can bow your knee and you can confess with your tongue to me that I am Lord. And then when I come back again, you'll have a seat in the auditorium where I play beautiful music. Don't reject the cornerstone, the centerpiece of what makes this thing good news of great joy. And then verse 12, Peter's climactic statement. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is described as the exclusivity of Christ. This is basically saying where Jesus says it himself in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man gets to the Father except through me. And this causes a lot of people in society and in politics and in other religions to get really, really upset at this point. Say, how dare he be so arrogant? Or how dare the church be so arrogant? Well, first of all, the church didn't make this up. And Jesus didn't make it up either. He just happens to be the way in. Here's the way it works. We've orphaned ourselves into sin. Jesus is the true son of God. And he's the only one. I, I have two children you guys hear about sometimes. Benny and Sophie. I'm crazy about them. And guess what? They have access to everything I own. Now they're only five years old. So I'm probably not going to give them the car keys. Benny has explored the idea of what it would take to start the car. And I think he could figure it out. Therefore, for sure, I'm not giving him the car keys. Yet. But when he's 16, if he needs to go somewhere, I'm his father. I'm his dad. He can have what he needs. What I have is his because he is my son. And here's the thing. Because we rejected God, disobeyed God, sinned against God, guess what? What he has isn't ours until we become part of the family again. But what he has is Jesus's. Jesus is the only one that has a key to the Father's house. And let's just stretch this illustration out a little bit more. It isn't a car key, all right? Our Father in heaven's home is a very sophisticated fingerprint on the door and then the door opens, okay? Or even more sophisticated where they like read the pupil of your eye or however that works and then the door opens, all right? You can't get in unless Jesus is escorting you in. Why? Because he's the only true son. He's the only perfect one who never rebelled against his loving Father and Creator. He is the indispensable piece of the puzzle. Now, let's say that I know that. I, I do know that. I believe that. Let's say, well, I want to be respectful of other people's views, and I'm all about that. We are the bridge because we want to make connections, okay? There's a lot of people that sometimes in the name of God have unnecessarily turned people away, and that grieves God's heart. But what would the most loving thing for me to do as a person and a pastor be if I knew that Jesus is the only way that you can get back into the family of God? I said, yeah, you, you, you can do it with good works. As long as your good things that way, your bad things, you can get in. Buddha's good. Muhammad's all right. New age is fine. If it feels right to you, that's cool. Man, it feels right some nights for me to eat a whole bag of Harvest Cheddar Sun Chips. <laughs> and I have done it. And I don't feel very good about an hour later. 
It is so crazy that we determine in our minds, oh, well, whatever feels good, if it feels right, that's what I'm going to do. Man, that's a recipe for big time disaster. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets back into the family of God apart from going through Jesus because he's the only one that has access to the Father's house. It's that simple. And that is good news of great joy because that means there's someone who does have access. Imagine there was no one who had access to the Father's house. God could have done that. But God loves us. So he gives to his true son access. And then by that, we get in. All right. Verse 13. Here's the, the th this is so cool here. All right. Because it says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Have you ever really wanted to be bold and you've, you know, been like uh, the cowardly lion? I, I mean, it's, it's, there's this moment where I really need to step up here and, and you don't. They're trying to intimidate Peter and John into fear and shrinking back and backing down. And they don't do it. They perceive that these were, okay, uneducated, common men. You know, it's so awesome about the gospel. You do not have to be educated. You do not have to have a seminary degree. You know what you need to do? You just need to walk with Jesus and you need to be in the word and you need to be attentive to God's voice and you need to be filled with the spirit. You do not need to know Greek. It says they were astonished. They recognized, here's the, thing, the key here, that they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. There is a, something that happens when you're with someone else. Okay, it's so funny how sometimes rumors and slanderous things can be said about someone else. And then, if, but if you really know that person, you know the truth. So rumors and slander, they, they don't hold up if you really know the character and the quality of the person. These guys had been with Jesus. And they know, hey, Jesus, he is the true son of God and he's the way by which we get in. All right. They recognize him. They've seen the man who was healed standing beside them, by the way. You can't argue with a crippled guy who couldn't walk for 40 years and now he can walk. There's not much they can do. So now they ask Peter and John to leave. And then they say, what should we do with these men? And then basically they say, oh, well, we know what we'll do. We're going to tell them to leave, but we're not going to want them to ever speak in that name again. Notice they won't even say the name of that person. Just, we don't want to know more about that name. And then they go and they tell Peter and John, we're going to let you go, but don't speak anymore in that name. Verse 19, Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. I mean, this is a, a, an incredible setup here. They're Jews who worship God. They just don't know Jesus as the indispensable piece of the puzzle. And they know that it is better to obey God than to obey men. So Peter throws it out at him and says, okay, you guys decide. Is it better to obey God or to obey men? You guys judge for yourselves about that. But for us, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. There is a, a powerful thing that happens when someone comes to an awareness of the fact that they were blind and now they see. They were lost and now they're found. When God, through the Holy Spirit, opens the eyes of someone so that they see Jesus as the rescuer, and they know that Jesus has rescued them. 
that cannot be silent. It doesn't mean that they're not going to have days where they drop the ball, that they're not going to have days where they miss the mark. But there will be a joyful gratitude in the heart of one that knows that they've been rescued by Jesus, the Son of God. They say, I cannot stop speaking about what I have seen and what I have heard. One of the exciting things about what God's done here at the bridge in the short time that we've watched Jesus plant and build this church is God has got a grip on our hearts and we can't stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. Not to exalt this church because that's not what we're exalting, but to exalt Jesus, the Son of God. And there are people that are coming and saying, I, I can't wait. This is exciting. Hey, I invited somebody. I can't wait. Because when Jesus is lifted up, he draws people to himself. As we uh, prepare to close today, I'd like you to go back to that illustration of <clears throat> our father's house, his home, and Jesus, the true son, in that home with the key and access to everything that our heavenly father has. And I'm, I'm going to ask you because I care about you and, and because God really is, it's not even me asking you, God wants to ask you this question. Where are you? And let me give you a couple options, not that it needs to be multiple choice, but it could be that you are way away from your father's house. And the, the, the hell of being away from his house has caught up with you. And you're beginning to cry out and say, rescue me. I need help, somebody, please come help. It could be that you, that you hear footsteps and you know it's good and it's Jesus and he's come to rescue you. Could be that Jesus has already picked you up. The Bible says in Psalm 40 that he lifts us out of a slimy pit and he places our feet on the rock. It could be that you've just experienced, even today, as this worship service has gone on, Jesus Christ himself grab your arm and place you on the rock. Then you need to speak about that, of what you've seen what you've heard and how he's rescued you. Could be Jesus has given you the piggyback ride on the way back to his father's house. You see, all who Jesus rescues, his father will save. His father will give access into that home. And you know what God's desire is? That every single human being make it home. Let's pray. Father, you are working, I know, today through your Holy Spirit, through your word. And you are prompting us, reminding us of how great it is to come home. So Lord, we ask that you would cause us to be like Peter and John today where we brag and boast about Jesus and we say that he is the only way because, not because he's seeking to be exclusive, but because we know Jesus, he is the one, you're the one who has access to the Father's house. Thank you for making that access available to us. Thank you for the good news of great joy for all people. May you rescue us and bring us home to the Father today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. We're going to stand and sing an awesome song that talks a lot about Jesus' name. And uh, I want to invite you guys to really express with your hearts, with your voices. I'm impressed with how well you guys sing. I, I pastored another church. Um, not that they didn't sing badly, and I do not sing well, okay? The Bible says make a joyful noise. I'm one of those joyful noise people. Um, but, but there's just a beauty in the way in which you guys, you guys sing. And it is appropriate when Jesus has rescued us to sing with great joy, to lift our hands and to say, you've rescued me and I'm thankful. I am yours and you are mine and you will be mine and I will be yours for all eternity. So let's stand as we sing this song. Amen. As you prepare to receive the benediction, just want to encourage you just to receive um, what God has for you and sometimes just outstretched palms. Uh, communicate that well. And now to the great God, our Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, may you remind us that Jesus, our rescuer, his love endures forever. His rescue mission will never fail. He will bring us home to you. Increase our faith that one day we may see you face to face. And on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God be with you as you go. Thank you for worshiping with us today.